one and live hey everybody how's it going hope you're having a lovely day so today i am here live with nicholas merrill from the calyx institute the calyx institute is a nonprofit dedicated to educating people on how they can take back their privacy and providing them with the tools and resources to allow them to regain control over their devices calyx institute was recently a recipient of a futo legendary grant legendary grants are grants of anywhere from five to seven figures given no strings attached to organizations projects and people that are focused on giving freedom privacy, control, and sovereignty back to users of their devices, which we believe that you're doing. So thank you very much for the work that you've been doing so far. Much appreciated. Yeah, we really uh, totally appreciate the support from FUTO. Uh, I think it's actually the biggest single grant that we've ever received, uh, especially considering we have some other grants that have lots of deliverables. Uh, but this is one that's just saying like, hey, keep doing what you're doing, which is the, the most rare and unicorn-like of, of grants. So, uh, yeah, much thanks for making that introduction for us, Lewis. Yeah, and I'll include links for anybody down below who are interested in this program. Now, uh, I wanted to talk about the Calyx Institute and the Android open source project that you've been working on that you're probably most known for in 2022. But before I really got into that, I wanted to go over some of the background that you have. You received a national security letter asking for information on a client of your ISP, from cell phone, tower data, email details, screen names, with an NDA attached that prevented you from saying anything public about this for 11 years. So you've been in this fight to try and retain people's privacy before most people even owned a smartphone or used touchscreens in their daily lives, much less before Android. So can you tell us a little bit about that and what that was like? Sure. Um, you know, it, it's hard to tell that whole story because, as you noted, it lasted for 11 years. But um, the really short version of it is I ran uh, one of the first internet service providers in New York City, and I had been doing that for around 10 years. Uh, September 11th happened. Uh, the Patriot Act was passed, and it kind of changed the legal landscape in terms of uh, government demands for data. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, we, we learn in school about the Bill of Rights, we learn uh, about the First Amendment and freedom of speech, and we learn about the Fourth Amendment and the restrictions that it places on government searches and seizures. But uh, under the Patriot Act, they expanded a power called national security letters. And national security letters basically allow the government uh, and, and when I say that, I mean like law enforcement mainly to write their own warrants without going to court. Uh, the, old, the old system was, uh, you know, the government says uh, a crime has occurred or is likely to occur and we need to uh, seize these records in order to prevent it or investigate it after it's happened. Uh, the new paradigm after the Patriot Act was they could just print out their own uh, warrant on a printer and run with it. Um, so, you know, I'm sitting at my office one day and, and an FBI agent comes by and gives me this letter and says, give us these uh, stacks of data. And uh, my initial reaction, and, and, and as I'm reading the letter, it also says I can never tell anyone that they've approached me. Um, so my first reaction was, well, where is the signature of the judge that, uh, that, that signed off on this? And also, what about my lawyer? Can I tell my lawyer? And they wouldn't tell me that it was okay to talk to a lawyer. But, you know, anyone who's watched, uh, you know, courtroom dramas knows that, you know, you can always talk to a lawyer, right? That's just a basic bedrock, uh, right that that we have as americans um so this put me in a, in a in a quandary where um i'm being asked to violate the rights of customers and i felt that and i still feel that uh service providers isps mobile phone companies uh and and these days you know social media and and all these types of services uh, have have uh, a ton of personal information about people, and what that that sort of comes with a certain degree of responsibility for protecting, um, or at least ethically uh, examining each request for private data. And uh, what ended up happening was, 
I I had my company had as a as a client the New York Civil Liberties Union, which is the New York branch of the ACLU, and I approached them uh, with this letter in my hand and talked to them about whether this was a legal request or not, and they felt that it wasn't a legal request, and so we ended up filing a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the idea of national security letters in general. Um, and courts repeatedly found that it was unconstitutional. Now, the letter didn't say what the consequences were if you didn't do what they said. So what was it like breaking the nondisclosure in the letter to talk to an attorney about it when the letter didn't even tell you what the consequence was for breaking the NDA? Like, that must have been a sweat-inducing moment. Yeah, it, uh, it, it was not fun. Um, and uh, I, I was super concerned about it. Um, you know, it's kind of ancient history, and I'm, I'm thinking a lot of the people watching this may not have been uh, politically conscious at that point, or, they, you know, they might have been really young, because 2001, 2004 is a long time ago. Um, but um, at that time, uh, you know, the war on terror was the big thing, the, the war in Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq, and uh, President Bush at that time said that he could declare anybody to be an enemy combatant and just kind of take them away without a trial, without uh, any evidence. And so that uh, weighed heavily on my decision because, uh, you know, the, it went hand in hand with a bunch of other statements he had made at the time, like you're, these very blanket statements, you're either with us or against us. And, uh, I, you know, I remember wondering, like, it does, does me standing up for uh, my constitutional rights or the constitutional rights of my clients mean that we're, I'm, I'm against, I'm against the government or I'm, I'm, you know, does this put me in the category of against us? Uh, it was very concerning. Um, but maybe part of, part of what gave me the confidence to do this was that I had known the lawyer that I worked with for years since even before he was a lawyer. So I kind of knew, uh, that he would hold what I was telling him in confidence. But then uh, the next step was going to talk to the ACLU about it, well, at first to the NYCLU and then to the national ACLU. And so pretty soon I had told three different lawyers about it. Um, and, you know, that that really started to concern me that I, I had not violated that commandment not to tell anyone once, but three times. Yeah, and just waiting for the moment at which you're just kind of like whisked away by men in, you know, suits and a black hat late at night for telling people this over the course of 11 years. I, I would not be able to live with the stress for that period of time. Now, before I get into the discussion of everything that you do, I just kind of wanted to reiterate the importance of privacy with this one recent piece of news that came up right before this interview to the point where it almost wasn't in my, my list of questions, which is this. It was in the New York Times. A dad took photos of his naked toddler for the doctor. Google flagged him as a criminal. Now, this is a case where somebody was take, taking photos because his child had a legitimate medical concern. The doctor said, send us pictures. He took pictures. He sent them. And Google reported him to the police. Now, the police did a full investigation and found that there was no crime committed, yet he was still disconnected from all of these different services. Um, it, from the article, it says, Google said reviewers had not detected a rash or redness in the area because definitely the people at the, the programmers at Google are definitely medical experts. And uh, they reviewed his account and it turned up uh, a picture from six months ago uh, that they considered problematic of a young child lying in bed with an unclosed woman who just so happened to be the, the boy's mother. And uh, Mark did not remember this video and no longer had access to it, but he said it sounded like a private moment that he would have been inspired to capture, not realizing it would ever be viewed or judged by anyone else. I can imagine waking up one morning. It was a beautiful day with my wife and I wanted to record it. If only I, we had slept with pajamas on, this all could have been avoided. And you know, many people will say, well, listen, why, do you, why are you all privacy wingnuts? I, I'm not doing anything wrong. I have nothing to hide. And the reality is that to, for me, what makes privacy important is something that I'm doing that is not wrong to me, my friends, my family, my loved ones, may be seen as wrong to somebody else who doesn't have context on that, context on that particular event. And you really don't know that something like this is wrong until you have the police knock on your door because you sent the photo to a, to a doctor. So like, what do you think when you read stories like this in the news where Google is unwilling to reinstate somebody's account even after the police have cleared them and the fact that they are 
going through all of your stuff in general to find things that could potentially be declared CSAM? Um, you know, I have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, first of all, because I'm a parent myself and I could totally imagine uh, being in a situation like this, especially during the pandemic when there was a lot of sort of telemedicine going on and remote doctor stuff. Uh, you know, not not everyone, especially during the early part of the pandemic, was able to easily go to a doctor's office or was it advisable? Um, so I could see how this is uh, the sort of convergence of two different things that that happened at the same time, all during the same period. Um, Apple and Google uh, started doing this kind of massive AI search of people's private data and one of the roots of this problem in the first place is the idea that uh, private data is being stored unencrypted in the cloud. Um, and this is this goes right to like one of the central aspects of the Calix Institute's mission, which is trying to develop and research uh, different systems where service providers won't have access to the communications and private data of people. So I mean, when I say that I'm talking about end to end encryption. Um, you know, the, 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 the massive privacy invasion and the ways that it's fed, uh, all people's data is fed into algorithms, uh, you know, impacting people's lives, uh, that are totally automated is super scary. Uh, and it's scary when they're correct. Uh, like if, if a woman is researching, uh, getting an abortion, or if you're a political dissident getting reported to, uh, a totalitarian government, um, that's scary enough. Um, or, you know, if you're uh, uh, a recovering addict and you're looking for, uh, uh, you know, uh, you're getting targeted with, with material trying to push you towards uh, doing online gambling and stuff like that. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, weird information that um, is derived from people's browsing history and people's private information that, uh, that puts people in, a, in just a ton of danger. And uh, so, you know, when when you have a situation like this where it's incorrect, it's even it's even scarier. Like when when people are being misidentified by facial recognition algorithms and uh, when uh, like in New York City, for instance, I guess you're aware that, you know, the easy pass, the uh, the system that lets you drive through tolls uh, is also used to track cars uh, comings and goings all throughout the city in, in places where they're not looking to collect the toll, but just uh, because it's a it's a tracking beacon that's in the cars. Um, these these types of systems, uh, which go above and beyond the Internet, it, it, like I said, it, it extends to things like easy pass or, or uh, street cameras, speeding cameras. Uh, it's 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 becoming basically a, a like a like an all pervasive system that can all be fed into one uh, bucket that can then uh, be used to sort of uh, you know it goes down the road of like what what you're seeing in in, in China sometimes so with the, with the social scoring and stuff like that it's it's it opens up the possibilities to abuse and uh, you know part part of again part of what we're working on at the institute is trying to figure out ways that we can protect people from. Uh, from basically, you know, what, what we're worried about is really is is the dragnet aspect of it. Um, th th there is no problem in my view with um, actual criminals being targeted for surveillance. That's always going to be a necessary thing. And law enforcement has a legitimate mission in trying to catch murderers, let's say, or uh, human traffickers, you know. But uh, when, when everyone's being caught up in the dragnet, that's really where uh, we have to say enough is enough. Yeah, the, the idea should not be let's collect data on everyone to see what everybody is doing all the time in their private life so that we can pick out the criminals. The idea should be we have a reasonable suspicion to believe that you are a criminal. Therefore, we will pursue a warrant in a court of law to, f to actually look into your data or search your house. It shouldn't be you search everybody by default because that's how you wind up fine. Again, there are people out there that, you know, there's one comment on the article from somebody saying, well, I remember one time my kids were playing in the sprinkler in the backyard or something. And one of the neighbors called the police to say that there was child sexual exploitation happening 
happening because of that, because, you know, the, the, the concept of the Karen neighbor. And um, the police just came by and laughed and drove away and said, you know, like, stop bothering us. And the idea that that could potentially be the person at Google that saw that and decided, yeah, we're going to keep this account flagged just because we don't like it, even after the police cleared them, is, is terrifying to me. Now, you've said that. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to I was just thinking about how, you know, the the combination of like not just Google, it's it's ring cameras from Amazon. It's all these different systems all getting tied together um, that the line between government collecting private information and private companies protect uh, collecting this information becomes very blurred uh, because it all ends up in the hands of government regardless. So you've said that ISPs, email providers, and online services store personal and revealing data. And if national security letters allow access to this data without asking a judge, where do you fit at Calix Institute into helping solve this problem? Basically, when, when I, uh, I got involved in this lawsuit, um, I, took, I took on this challenge, and the, the path that we chose was litigation. So we went to court. Um, at the same time, uh, when the judge ruled that national security letters were unconstitutional, and this happened just a couple of months after we started in 2004, uh, Congress started to look at uh, the Patriot Act because the Patriot Act was passed in, in extreme haste. And if you printed it out, it's, it's like that fat. It's, it's, a, it's a huge stack of uh, papers, and a lot of it went back and modified previously existing laws and like uh, removed restrictions and opened things up to uh, much more abuse because they removed a lot of the oversight. Um, we spent seven years challenging the unconstitutional request for data and uh, ultimately won that in 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 the res in the respect that um, we didn't hand over the data. We we were never forced to hand over any of the information. But so you won. The, well, it's it's like it's kind of it's much more nuanced than that. Um, yes, one a couple times, the principle was about that data, but really winning to me would mean actually preventing the behavior from happening moving forward, and that unfortunately wasn't able to happen because the government withdrew the request for data. So once they withdrew the request for data, it meant that I no longer had standing to question whether it was constitutional for them to request that data from me. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, not a lot of other companies or people were willing to do that. Um, but, but as I was saying, uh, like, I, so we, we took this litigation, uh, we took this litigation approach and, um, you know, during that time, Congress started to re-examine the Patriot Act and, and what they had passed because they they did it all in like one overnight voting session. They just passed this gigantic law, which was like thousands of pages, uh, but without having time to properly read it. Um, the, that, you know, started a whole legislative approach to like reform. They were like, "Is does this make sense? Is this legal? Is this OK that we're doing things this way? Uh, balancing that concern with the constitutionality and legality of it with the extreme fear that came from the war on terror and and the fear of further terrorist attacks like September 11th. Um, so there, there essentially are three things that you can do to deal with this. One is litigation to try to challenge the laws. The second is the legislative approach. Unfortunately, during this entire time, they kept calling witnesses to testify and talk about what they had seen or what they knew, but I couldn't talk about it because of the gag order that we mentioned earlier, the, or as you called it, an NDA, but it was, uh, it was essentially a government gag order telling me I couldn't talk about it. So I, that meant I also couldn't testify or I then received one of these letters. In fact, my whole lawsuit was done under the name of John Doe because I couldn't be identified. Um, the third way that you can deal with this is from a technical point of view. And it made me realize, because I had a whole period of time, seven or eight years, when I couldn't talk about this at all. I couldn't tell anyone that I was involved in this. And that included uh, my girlfriends at the time, or my mother and father, or my friends, or my work colleagues, no one. So I had a lot of time when I just was able to have an introspective, uh, self-examining period of time. And, and when I say, you know, it was seven or eight years. 
uh, I thought about that the third way that you can deal with this is from a technological point of view. And I thought, why is it that the phone company and the internet and all these systems don't, don't have built in privacy protections inherent in them? Why, why is that not baked into them? So that's why we started the Calix Institute uh, with the idea of trying to develop technology that has privacy protections baked in. Um, and that's a, uh, a concept known as privacy by design. So one of the things that you're known for at Calix Institute is Calix OS, which I used, I've tried use, um, tried several times, and I did a quick video overview of it. And it's actually pretty cool, you know, it's, where it's, it's based on Android, open source project, and a lot of the, the thing, one of the things that I was impressed with is that a lot of the things that you would expect to not work out of the box, based on me trying a lot of other Android open source projects like three or five years ago, surprisingly work. Like, I, I can use Uber, I can use Grubhub, I can use Lyft. Um, can you talk a little bit about the development of Calyx OS and what your, what your goals are with that? Sure thing. Um, from, from like a 10,000 foot, uh, you know, vantage point, the, the three goals for Calyx OS are to encrypt the content of communications as much as possible, and then to take countermeasures against metadata collection as much as possible and also to take countermeasures against geolocation tracking as much as possible. Because those, from my point of view, are the three major problems in privacy when it comes to mobile and internet, and internet communications. Um, <clears throat> when, when, you, when you realize that, but you can read a lot of opinion polls, Pew, Pew polling agency and lots of others have talked to people about uh, their feelings about privacy online and their privacy with regards to mobile carriers. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, what you learn is that um, people want privacy really badly, but they aren't really willing to make huge sacrifices to get it. And from a developer's point of view, that uh, is a really big challenge because uh, it's often said that there's a, a trade-off between security and usability, um, using you know uh, security as a stand-in for privacy because they're kind of similar concepts. Um, what what you really need to do uh, is sort of our philosophy is you kind of have to meet people where they are. So when you specifically mention things like being able to do Uber or uh, Grubhub or you know there's all this online dating apps. Uh, when you when you take uh, the Android open source project and you strip away Google's proprietary layer, uh, you're you're left with sort of a gaping void where a lot of the services that people come to expect and rely on for uh, the convenience of their mobile phone don't work. So we spent a ton of time trying to figure out how we could um, give people an automatic level of privacy while requiring the least amount of sacrifice possible from them. So it's sort of like trying to thread a, a needle um, and, and walk a very fine line where uh, people get the most privacy uh, increases that you can get without driving them crazy by, uh, by having things that they expect to work not work. Yeah, like many applications require this thing called Google Play services. Most people that, that use Android, they know Google Play in terms of the store, but they don't realize that there's Google Play services, which is just constantly digging in and collecting information on you. As a, I'll leave a couple of links in the description below. Um, you have several on your website as well, where they're just, it, it, and it goes over all the different ways that it's collecting information on you all the time. And that's, the, it's not just the store that you get your apps from, it's also constantly providing information. Uh, you've added in it's a bunch of different pieces to try and fill in the gap between what Google offers and having nothing at all. So, like on my, uh, you know, like my um, S10e with their Android, I see Google Maps when I load Uber. On Calyx, when I load Uber, I see Mapbox. It's different, but uh, it works. You have organic maps as well, so people could find the way around without Google services. You have Nextcloud on there by default as a, a bundled app instead of Google Drive, which is going to, you know, again, give me a higher level of security with my stuff. So you've struck a good balance between privacy and usability. Can you talk about the difficulties involved in building and balancing an operating system that respects your privacy? while staying far away from mainstream solutions that take advantage of users? Because Google is so ingrained into our lives that what I found is that when you try to rip it out, it feels like you're losing a kidney. Sure thing. Um, 
you know, first of first and foremost, we're we're like an open source based organization. So all the work that we do is trying uh, our best to make open source privacy solutions that then other people can build uh, other tools on. So, you know, part of our mission talks about making building blocks that service providers can use to build privacy by design into their services. And uh, that's why uh, we always try to use standards based uh, things like WebDAV for file storage in the cloud uh, and Nextcloud. And, um, you know, we, we try to leverage all the existing privacy uh, ecosystem out there, like Tor is very integrated into Calyx OS and Signal, having Signal and WhatsApp be supported in the dialer for encrypted calling. Um, you know, these are different ways that we uh, try to work within the, the existing community uh, of people developing open source privacy software and, uh, you know, give people tools that they really can, uh, they can self host in, in many cases, or if not, they can find uh, different third party service providers that they trust. Uh, you know, it's, it's really, um, it's really a matter of uh, you know, the, the way we view it, the open source community is all about having uh, the ability to to uh, modify software, to examine the software, to have it be subject to public scrutiny, to have audits be conducted on the source code, to know exactly what it's doing. Um, you know, the, the, the whole hacker community is all about uh, taking things apart so that you understand how they work, right? I mean, that's the ultimate uh, origin of, of most of it. And, um, you know, we, we uh, aren't against people using proprietary software. I mean, you, you mentioned a bunch of proprietary apps that you use, and I use some too. Um, and sometimes those are the best solutions and it's unavoidable. Uh, but we are always hoping to build open source equivalents or or at least things that are good enough uh, for now while retaining, you know, people's ability to use uh, closed source stuff if that's really what they want to do. Uh, but the idea is that you, you have a good starting point that's all free software that's as private as, as we can achieve now. And then we'll continue to iterate and try to improve on that uh, every version that we release. Now, a, a lot of this is provided by MicroG, which replaces Google Play services. So it allows me to use something that would otherwise require Google's proprietary layer, but without actually using it. And uh, there's countless studies demonstrating just how often Google Play services is phoning home and reporting information on me that I don't want reported to people that I don't want to know these things. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the decision to use MicroG versus, let's say, something like sandboxed Google Play services? Sure. Um, you know, for us, using a, a project like MicroG is sort of like a no-brainer. Um, it's open source. It's purpose-built to be more private, uh, but to replace um, Google's proprietary version with one that's open source and one that um, deliberately only passes as much information upstream as it needs to to get the job done. So MicroG's approach uh, began with examining the dozens of APIs that are built into Google Play and re-implementing them in order of how important they were or are. And the first thing that they did was implement push services. So that's how you get notifications when you get a signal message, or that's how you get notified when there's a new Instagram post or something. Um, push notifications are what makes your phone work in real time. Um, if, if you didn't have push notifications, you would have to actually like open up Instagram to find out if there's new stuff going on. So, uh, if you don't get, uh, messages in a timely manner, then your phone is only of that much, uh, use, you know, use to you. Um, and so the second one that they implemented, as far as I know, is the location services API. Um, but the problem with that, one of the problems with that is that it's constantly sending your location back to Google and then it's being stored. Um, we replaced that with a plugin that uh, instead uses Mozilla's free location services. 
Uh, and that has a much better privacy policy and it's not an organization that's built on uh, data mining. It's, you know, one with a much different mission. It's an, it's another nonprofit organization like our own. And, uh, you know, it's, we're, we're not saying that this is like the end all be all uh, perfect solution to this, but it's, it's an incremental improvement uh, and it's sort of better than the status quo. Um, so the third one that they did was the, uh, the mapping API. And that's the one that you said you see when you go into Uber and instead of using a third party service called Mapbox, uh, but that's all routed through one account that, uh, is connected to the Calix Institute. So it's not, uh, them collecting a dossier on you, Lewis, and where you've gone. It's all through one, one setup for us. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's basically like a no-brainer for us that we would try to work on the open source uh, solutions to this rather than try to uh, try to Im improve the you know the closed source Google version because in the end we don't really know what uh, what the closed source software is doing. What areas of development are the most challenging to you at this point in time, and what are the things that you would do if more, or like if fifty people like Fudo came out and said, "Here's a bunch of money, you know, go to town." Yeah. Um, well, there there are a bunch of challenges. I mean, one thing that we're running into now is um, new versions of Android come out uh, periodically every year or so. Uh, when we started this project, we were on Android 8, and then there was version 9 and 10 and 11 and 12, and now we're working on version 13. So every time that happens, we have to take all of the changes that we've made to the Android open source project, or all the stuff that we've built on top of it, and we have to port it to the new version. Um, at the same time, we've been increasing, slowly increasing the number of phones that we support. So at first, when we started, we were only supporting a few Google Pixel phones because uh, there's a number of reasons. One is that their hardware security is better than pretty much all other phones. Um, <clears throat> but, but another reason is that the Pixels are the reference hardware that the Android open source project is built for. So it pretty much always just works. A new phone comes out, you compile it for that phone, and it just works. You just answered um, the question that my audience was going to kill me if I didn't ask you, which is, what the fuck, man, with all this anti-Google stuff, you're using a, hmm. the device uses a Pixel by default. And that's a crit A lot of these Android open source projects I see, not just yours, like Graphene and others, they start with the Pixel. Right. Um, well, so I would make a distinction there. I mean, I, I'm not, we're not an anti-Google organization. Um, Google is a mixed bag, you know, some, some parts of their business model, I have very strong disagreements with, um, but other things that they do, such as keeping the Android open source project open source enables us to do what we're doing now. Uh, and the same with all the other Android, uh, builds that are out there. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's not so black and white again. It's kind of a nuanced situation. And uh, yeah, we, we start with those pixels, but um, there's, a, there's a reason why we've been working on supporting other brands of phones. And it's not because of being anti-Google. It's actually because Google pixels are only sold in around 12 countries in the world. Um, they're mostly like Western European countries, the United States, Canada, you know, maybe Japan. Um, but you know there's 200 and something countries in the world and we want as part of our mission we want the privacy software that we build to be available to the most number of people possible so we've spent a lot of time uh since from 2018 through today uh trying to get our software to run on other phones that are not made by google because uh they're more available in different parts of the world so we first supported the uh xiaomi me a2 back in 2018 and we supported it for a bunch of years until it reached end of life from the manufacturer uh, but even today we support the fairphone 4 and we're also working on builds for one plus uh three different models of it the 8t the 9 and the 9 pro and the reason for that is those phones are available globally um so you know it's it's super important to us 
uh, on a number of levels because, like I said, pixels aren't that widely distributed or available. So people in South America really can't get them. People in Africa can't get them. People in all parts of many parts of Asia can't get them. Um, therefore, we have to look for um, other manufacturers that we can port our software to. But uh, unfortunately, it's it's a lot harder to get our software running on these other third party phones. Um, but it's so important to us to fulfill our mission that uh, it's very worth the effort to us. If we had, um, you know, 50 more donors like Futo, uh, we would hire more and more developers and uh, we would hire more uh, user experience people to make sure that all the work that we're doing is super easy for people to use um, and doesn't uh, become a turnoff when uh, it doesn't work 100% uh, the same as stock Android. Yeah, so this leads into my next question, which is what do you believe the greatest hurdle is standing between not just Calyx, but other Android open source forks that have similar ideals to you? having greater adoption than they do now? Because if I were to spitball it, I can't imagine more than 1% or 5% of the Android marketplace are people that are using a ROM other than what came on their phone. You know, one thing that would be super amazing would be if we could ever find a partnership with, with uh, a phone manufacturer, um, whether it would be, you know, Mitsubishi or Nokia or Xiaomi or OnePlus. Uh, if if those phone makers would offer it as an option, like the same way when you order a Dell laptop, you can you can get it with Linux instead of Windows. Um, that took a be, while. Yeah, it took a really long time, and it took a lot of uh, you know encouraging them and cajoling them and trying to pull them along. And then finally, they saw that there was a market for that, and uh, you know it 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 made sense to them. So I think one of the things that we need to do is, and, and based on my understanding of how these companies operate, you need to make a business case for them that it's worth their time and energy to support alternative uh, software like that. Um, so that's one way if manufacturers would offer uh, different, different options pre-installed on the phones. Um, you know, another way could be uh, just developing easier and easier ways to install the software on the phones. So a lot of that has been, uh, a lot of progress has been made on that front by building web-based installers for uh, flashing Android uh, variants onto phones. Um, so, you know, there's, there's different ways, but that I think has limits to its scalability. Like I, I'm not sure that mainstream people are really going to ever want to get a phone and then, uh, reinstall the software on it because it's just more than what they're willing to do. Yeah, I think like the mo I think the biggest thing that I imagine is standing in the way of it is a people don't know what it is, and b any time if somebody installs Uber on the device, they're in the middle of nowhere at two in the morning after a party, and it doesn't work. They're like, screw this, I'm never trying this again. And you fix you've helped a lot of that by allowing the phone the way that you get it to have this compromise where you're protecting as much privacy as humanly possible while maintaining the basic usability that people are going to expect. Um, do you see your future threatened at all by the trend of phones coming on the market with locked bootloaders that are not uh, unlockable by normal consumers? This is a problem that Aaron had. He wanted to try uh, both Graphene, Calyx, and E um, on, uh, on a phone. So he goes to the store and he asks if the bootloader is unlocked. The person at the counter didn't know the difference between it being unlocked by carrier and unlocked bootloader. So they sold him a phone with a locked bootloader and he goes back and he's arguing with them that it's not unlocked because they don't even know whether or not what they're selling as an unlocked bootloader. So like, do you think that that's going to make it uh, more difficult for all these different operating systems? Or do you believe that, that, that uh, f devices like the Pixel will continue to allow people like you to unlock the bootloader into the future? I think uh, manufacturers not not being, I, I would say that's being not developer friendly, um, not allowing someone to unlock a phone and install a different operating system is similar to like if you bought that Dell laptop we discussed five minutes ago and they wouldn't let you remove Windows and install Linux on it. Um, it's kind of an anti-competitive thing and um, it's... Uh, it's really like it, it comes back to I know the, the, the right to repair stuff that you work on, um, you know, allowing people to uh, control their devices is, is a basic right that should be um, supported by 
the phone makers. Um, in the same way that uh, in the states here, uh, Congress passed all these laws that said that carriers uh, would have to unlock, as far as carrier unlock, uh, phones so that they couldn't just stick you on AT and T and you can never leave with that phone. You'd have to get a new phone. Um, you know, there there have been sort of some legislative efforts like that one, uh, but but the but that law talks about carrier locking, not about bootloader unlocking, and it's two totally separate things. And most people aren't aware that you can unlock a phone and install a different operating system on it at all. Um, so it's kind of hard to get to the point where Congress would um, would pass a law to to enforce that. Um, I know, like in in Europe, uh, there have been a lot of more potentially heavy handed uh, efforts to try to do things like standardize the charging and data ports on devices. Like they're trying to standardize uh, on USB C and and trying to force Apple to. Uh, switch from like Thunderbolt ports on their uh, on their phones to USB C because uh, I think they're coming at it from a whole different point of view of just e waste and there being like hundreds of chargers sitting in a drawer in everyone's house uh, and and how crazy that is um, but you know potentially there could be uh, government uh, efforts to try to force uh, manufacturers to allow people to put their own software on phones, which would then sort of deal with that problem. Because when it comes down to it, yeah, most of the big manufacturers' phones, we can't support them. They, they're they either unlockable, or if they are unlockable, then uh, they can't be relocked with a third-party signing key, which is sort of a prerequisite for the level of security that we support with Calyx OS. Yeah, one of the primary points of the founder of Fudo's vision is that you should be able to program your own computer. You bought it, you own it, you should be able to write software for it. And like the idea with a normal desktop or laptop that I can't install an operating system of my choice, I don't think anybody would accept that. But it's weird that we completely, we readily accept it with phones that cost about as much as a computer. I mean, you, know, you can, there are a lot of phones nowadays that cost $1,200. That's the cost of a fairly decent desktop or laptop computer. And you're not allowed to install the operating system of your choice on it, which is insane. Because the criticism that a lot of people had with the Apple ecosystem is, you know, I can't install what I want on my device. I can't install my, I, can, I have to install software from the App Store. And then, you know, for a lot of Android devices to come along and say, well, you can't install the version of the Android that you want. It seems insane. It's particularly now that they're avoiding the warranty if you unlock the bootloader. So doing so, if you have an issue with your hardware, if you have Ghost Touch on your screen and your volume button stops working, they could say, sorry, you installed a different operating system as if that has anything to do with it. And, you know, there are people in my chat saying they need movement on that in Congress. But I imagine anybody who watched any of the hearings, but listening to House and Senate representatives speaking to Mark Zuckerberg, Tim Cook, or Jeff Bezos in summer of 2020, were prop they were throwing rocks at their television probably realize that's not happening anytime soon. Well, that's why the work that you're doing with right to repair is so important, actually, because, um, you know, I think it goes beyond repairing and, and it also just gets into your right to be able to work on devices and and modify them and uh, just use them in the way that you please once you've paid for them. So what do you think would be the best way possible to get more people to know about and understand what your project is? Because I'm interested in increasing the size of the pie of all these Android open source projects, whether it's a EOS, Calyx, Graphene, Lineage. The more people get away from Google Play services on their device and the more they understand how these devices are abusing them, uh, the better. Like, What do you think needs to happen for as many people as humanly possible to start using something like this. I use it as my daily driver on my phone now, and I have been uh, free of uh, the crack of stock Android for about a full two weeks now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're doing our best to spread the word. We're doing our best to make it easy. Um, I think word of mouth is, is a very important thing. Uh, we've also been exploring partnerships with a couple of different phone makers who are like up and coming phone makers, not not Nokia, not, uh, you know, uh, Motorola, but uh, up and coming ones and talking to them about whether we can uh, become much more supported by their phones and whether we can help them reach new audiences. Um, but I, like I said, I think that uh, one of the most important things is figuring out how to make a business case for the phone makers to support 
um, alternative operating systems and offer them as options when you buy the phones. Um, it, it seems to me like, uh, you know, you can you can you can write letters all you want, and you can try to pass laws all you want. But uh, sometimes, what it comes down to is making it clear to uh, those businesses that there's money there. Um, so I think you know, through doing that, we could get more people to use alternative operating systems, and by doing that, uh, more people would would see that it's uh, it's an option. Because as you correctly noted, like most people don't even know that this is a thing. Yeah, most people don't aren't even aware of how much data their phone is collecting on them and sharing at any given time. And like, I think at the moment that somebody has to spend twenty minutes searching XDA developers to figure out how to unlock their bootloader to install something, you've immediately lost about ninety five percent of the population at that point. So having devices that show up with the operating system is great. And like, I was able to get this by becoming a member of Calix Institute. And I know that there are other vendors out there that will install a Android open source project ROMs of your choice on their different phones and ship it to you. So you don't have to do any configuration or messing around with ADB. Uh, any any closing remarks? Because I'm out of questions. Um, no, I just wanted to thank you uh, so much for the opportunity to chat with you today and uh, for asking me all these really interesting questions. And I also wanted to, again, thank you for your work on Right to Repair, because I think that's a really exciting movement. And I think it intertwines with the work that we're trying to do. And uh, you know, helping people gain control of their data, gain control of their devices. Um, and, uh, and, and again, I wanted to thank you for uh, helping us get this grant, which is uh, going, to put, going to be put to use uh, furthering our mission. Oh, th uh, and, thank, and thank you very thank much. You guys. For yeah, and thank you guys for supporting our mission in the first place. So, oh, Thank you so much, for, and I hope you continue doing what you're doing. Um, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Fuck, I forgot my catchphrase. I pulled a Steve. It's not supposed to be have a great day. It's that's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. Ah, oh, well, next time. I'll edit that out. See you all in the next video. Bye now.